Hello and welcome to the Startups of London podcast. I'm your host Ozan and founder of Startups of London. Today I'm joined by Giuseppe Milazzo, founder of Cont App. Contap is defined as the smarter and more convenient way of digitally managing and utilizing business cards. Welcome, Giuseppe. Hello, Ozan. Thanks for uh, inviting me to the podcast. Yes, nice to have you here. So uh, let's start uh, with with the difficult questions. Uh, how has your business? How has it been affected by this by this transition we've been going through as a world uh, where we have less face to face interactions with people? Yes. It had a massive impact actually on the startup. Um, we actually launched in the app stores about two weeks before COVID hit the UK. So um, yeah, it was a bit of a, a grey area for us because obviously we didn't know COVID was going to be such a big thing. And I remember, I remember very well. Sorry to interrupt a bit for the audience out, out there. Uh, startups of London and Quantap have started their lives in in very similar in in, in very close dates. So so we've we've known each other for some time. We've swapped some content. We've gone through the like the timeline of the challenges. I, I feel for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a bit of a troubling time for startups, especially launching a business at that time. So yeah, we managed to turn the crisis into an opportunity, and you know here we are still growing, and users uh, keep growing as well. So. Yeah, it's been a bad thing, but we've managed to turn it into a good thing. So tell us about the app. Tell us about the product, the tech side of it, the business side of it. Just like, just give us an overview so we can dive into details. Sure. Uh, so Contap is a bootstrap tech startup. We built a user-friendly, all-in-one business card solution. So rather than having an app for a business card, an app for a business card scanner, an app for a CRM, uh, Contap um, is all of those three in one simple to use application. So it works yeah. as a business card, business card scanner and a business card Some manager. Um, yeah, yeah. So yes. just, just for us to get some context, can you let us understand your background before prior to starting Contap? Yeah, um, so my background has always been in marketing. So I've worked for, you know, alongside businesses such as Xerox, Mercedes Benz, uh, big e-commerce yeah. businesses. Mm-hmm. So I was going to a lot of networking events and exhibitions yeah. and, you know, just like probably you, yourself and some of the listeners, you come back with piles of business cards that, you know, you get back to the office. Yeah, throw I, them in, I had in a the large back of deck of them, yeah. It's, it's a massive uh, waste of paper, a waste of resources. Market. And I just thought there must be an easy way to obviously manage these contact details because, you know, Going back to the office, having to manually type it all out onto CRM is quite boring and very time-consuming. It so, is. Um, yeah, that's kind of where the idea of contact came around, really. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I learned as an entrepreneur is to, to, to read sorry. and to, to, to learn from other people. Yeah. And a key idea there was well, the, the people who come up with the best startup ideas are people from marketing. Uh, yeah, there, yeah. Was, there was this oh, man, yeah, interesting yeah. correlation in terms of the success rate of the startup versus the background of the founders. And uh, it was really striking because it, it turns out marketing people are, but especially people who have real life experience in launching products, perhaps experiencing a few failures. So those are the key people who who have a, a knack for understanding okay there might be an opportunity here and so on so yeah. going back to those days what went through your mind when you said mm, there might be an opportunity here and how, like if if you compare how you were thinking that yeah. day versus yeah. what you know today what what has changed what is the contrast um there's quite a lot actually i think once you're actually in the business and you know you started the business from scratch and doing it for the first time uh, you like like you mentioned earlier, you network with a lot of different people. You talk to a lot of people, different experiences, different ways of doing things, and I think that's really what what's changed from when the idea came about to where I am now. It's just about you know talking to different people, different experiences, and actually going out to to do it yourself rather than you know just being a thinker rather than a, a doer. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I think that's been a massive part of this whole journey for me so far. What would you 
if if you ran into your old former self in a pub, what would you say to him uh, about the business so that his life is a bit easier and and he's just a bit more successful? Um, I think the first thing would be is to just keep going. Um, mm. You know, from from an outside point of view, before I started Contact, I thought you know by within the first year I'll have I don't know a thousand two thousand users and you know I'll be flying and you know all of this kind of stuff, but in reality businesses aren't just a, a trajectory upwards it's it's like a, a roller coaster of emotions up and down it is. so yeah you have to just kind of be be consistent network with the right people and uh, okay. just carry on going celebrate small well, wins please. and yeah there's so so much to learn when you're actually in in the job exactly it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult journey yeah. and you know what i love about human beings is we like the, the, i think there are different layers to learning about something you can learn about you, you can just read a blog and learn about something yeah or you can literally burn your hand and learn that okay i should not stick my hand in there is it like it really messes exactly my hand that. up yeah, yeah. the second one is more visceral it's more emotional it's, uh, it's more it's, it's it's a bigger experience in a way right oh 100 yeah i think i've learned more in these two years like, in contact than i have in all my other jobs put together So um, I think once you're in the deep end, uh, you have to kind of keep paddling, otherwise you'll sink. That's kind of how I see it. Yeah, and what I love about it is also the variety of the things that you learn as a founder. It's oh, not it's just crazy. about so yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> like tell tell us, walk us through the things that that just pop into your head when you take a retrospective look at these past years. What what are the key things that you've learned? Well, when you're a solo startup founder, you have to be the accounts, you have to be HR, you have to be marketing, you have to be sales, you have to be finance. So, you know, everything in the business has to be done by yourself. Mm. So even small things like invoicing and um, you know, accounts and content creation and sales, network, there's so many aspects to a business that, You probably don't realize until you're you're doing it yourself, no. which probably something that you've probably found as well with startups of London. Yeah, um, exactly. It's there's the, so many elements to it that you don't understand until you're actually actually doing it. It's uh, so layered. It's yeah. so, so complex, and uh, the, I loved trying to understand complex yeah. systems Very because I feel I'm not good. wasting my time. Yeah. <laughs> Where yeah. I, I like so there is there's a fundamental this. truth out I, there. And if I just keep digging and digging, I'll get to something. I like that feeling. Yeah. So I like messing with complex things. And building a business is a complex thing on the one hand. But let me share a learning of mine uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship. Yes, it's complicated, but it, at the same time, it's very simple. There, there are there, are, but it's it's very deceptive in that sense. But there are, there are few simple facts about business that is uh, really it's incredibly easy to gloss over them. And these are things like make something people want. Yeah. Like this, this sentence is so, it's so simple. It's deceptive, really. What do you yeah. think about them? Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Because yeah, if there's no need for the product, then you're kind of selling it to no one. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it sounds very simple, but it's one of the most important things to to realize when you're starting a business uh, which is why you know before we obviously launch contact yeah. we've done a lot of market research on so is there a need for this product and what's already available which isn't you know contributing to that solution so that is a big part of prior to starting a business how did you run through that research and if you look back to it now how accurate do you think it was Um, so how we done the research was I created a Google Forms, so in, in the form of, you know, there was about eight questions on there mm -hmm. and it was just um, for people on LinkedIn and Facebook to, to say, basically an answer those questions in like optional, optional circumstances. So do you use business cards, for example? Yes. Yeah. How many business cards do you save on average this many? So it's very um, multiple choice questions. Mm -hmm. So it's quick because I don't know about you, but if I get a form and yeah, I have to write see. paragraphs after paragraphs, I, it's kind of a waste of my time, really. So I think yeah, yeah. Quad, um, qu quantitative data is um, 
very key in that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, it is. It is. I think one well, thing that I, yeah. I would have changed is to to get more people to do the research. So we had about 120 people take part in that, and I think maybe double that would have would have cemented the findings a bit more. I use this uh, tool called Prolific. But I, I can recommend it actually for for other entrepreneurs there out okay. there. It, it can be useful uh, to, to gather people in, in in a really short amount of time and yeah, get them to actually fill fill their questions up. And, and you can be really selective. I'm like I'm not affiliated, but I think just it's a good service out there. All oh, right, I've never heard of that um, yeah, platform good. before. It's good. Yeah. It saves a lot of time. You just pay some. Uh, people are get people are paid, so that can, you have to calculate that. So they might be yeah. overly nice. So you have yeah, to yeah. harsh uh, towards uh, yourself. Yeah, I think um, I think well, it's a bit of a, a whip, um, an outside point of view, but I think feedback is so um, important now that you know Facebook, uh, not Facebook, sorry, Twitter and LinkedIn now have polls, which obviously contribute to the market research. So I think. That just shows that a lot of people are, are moving to polls and market research in the form of social media as well as you know, Google Forms and uh, the platform you mentioned earlier. Yeah, interestingly enough, if you think about it, uh, what triggered this whole uh, ma matter of Elon Musk buying Twitter was the poll he he did, right? Do you remember that? Yeah, he, he said, yeah, like, yeah. How democratic do you think Twitter is? And then it's kind of his market research in his own way. Exactly that, yeah, and he's definitely got the uh, the right audience to to give yeah. that answer. He's because... got the volume, a few millions. So exactly, yeah, yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> that's yeah, that's like even he does it. So uh, even if you have unlimited, basically unlimited amount of money, you still need to do your market research. And if you have less money, you need you you need to invest more in market research. Th that's one of the key lessons every entrepreneur learns when we yeah, start yeah. our uh, our journeys. We have this flair about us and, and we think like we are on top of the world we are geniuses when it comes to spotting market opportunities but yeah. that's not how we differentiate as a founder it's just i think bizarre that in early 2000s this wave of the content that we were exposed to that that came from silicon valley especially on like the facebook's and so on or and yeah. and the myspaces like that created a certain set of expectations and uh, and prejudices i would say on yeah. what defines a good entrepreneur and it's almost like this mythical beast of this this introverted person who just looks at the sky and comes up with a million dollar business idea and then yeah <laughs> and make and you look so easy yeah yeah and then just three days later this and i think we, we were all victimized by this i like i i put myself in that group i was victimized by this because that's what i thought entrepreneurship was at the time i completely agree with that and in in time you find out oh okay like it it really doesn't matter it yeah i mean ideas are pretty easy in the sense that like this has been so overused and uh, and perhaps talked uh, too much but still i think there is value in 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 understanding when people say execution matters what do they actually mean like in uh, like let's talk about this i'll share my perspective and then you share your perspective on what yeah, yeah. Why, why you think that is yeah. so in my understanding when people say execution matters, they're actually talking about decision making and yeah. decision making in two layers, big decisions and small decisions. The small decisions you make uh, every day, every week, big decisions you make once or twice a year or perhaps once in every six months or, or, or every quarter, but not more frequent than that. So execution is actually a showing the tenacity and, and, and the width of a perspective to make the right decisions and then being a hardworking student to, to actually follow that up. And it's difficult. It's very tough to, to combine those two together because in a large organization, usually these people are different people. You have the people who have been selected to be good at decisions. That's debatable, of course, but they're in the higher ranks of the organization. And then you have the people who do, who do the execution, who get paid and then, then they're easily replaceable. But in a startup, you have to carry those both of those roles within yourself, and that can be extremely difficult. So yeah. that's my perspective. But I don't know. I'm learning, and it might change in a few years. Yeah, I I've, I completely agree with what you've just said. I think decisions in a startup can are massive compared to well, if you're doing it in a team, for example. Uh, as a solo founder, you have to make them decisions on your own, which can be 
difficult sometimes because you haven't got that person to turn around to and say, what do you think about this decision or what do you think if we pivot to this or this and that? Definitely. So, um, yeah, it is, it is definitely a, a lot harder when you're on your own because, you know, you haven't got anyone to say, it's a good idea, but what about if we do this instead? So it's a different point of view. So yeah, I, I completely agree with what, what you said. It is all about decision making, which then stems to, you know, where should we launch our product? Should we go to this channel or this channel, which is obviously another big decision. And so, you have a few big decisions uh, ahead yourself. I, I was going through some of the content yeah. online and I've, I've ran into this sentence and I would like to just read it and expand on that together. You mentioned that rather than being your average business car scanner, we're pivoting towards becoming an all-in-one personal business hub, which plans yeah. to integrate softwares within our app as well as CRM platforms uh, further along your roadmap. So yeah. this is this right itself. Uh, this right here is a is a is a is a strategic high level. Is one of the decisions that you make once or twice a year, right? A hundred percent. Yeah, uh, the integra integrations part of uh, our roadmap, which is which is next, is one of the biggest steps that we're taking forward now to going from what how we launched the business just it was meant to be just a business card and business card scanner to now being like a link between a business card business card data and actually using that data for um, business use mm. so for example saving it to a crm or scheduling a meeting through zoom or you know you know the, the, that's kind of the, the roadmap that we're going down now um, which is a massive decision for us because then obviously when we go into that kind of area of business, then we kind of come up against different challenges. Mm -hmm. Different again, competitive landscape. Different exactly people. that. Yeah. Yeah. So how did, how did you make that decision? What, what was the emotional process? What was the intellectual process of reaching to this conclusion? Um, it's just from talking to users really. So a lot, a lot of the people I speak to say, oh, I love the app, that it does this and this, I don't have to print any business cards, etc. But it would be great if I could actually use that data to then save into a CRM or, you know, use this information to upload into MailChimp automatically. So a lot of it was from user data. And actually 95% of all of our updates are from user feedback. We're very user-centric um, startup, which... Again, comes back to because I'm a solo founder, I don't have anyone on my team to turn around to. So I depend on user feedback to help me with, with that growth. I'll actually download the app. I confess to not having used it. Uh, I'll download and I'll give you some feedback myself. Oh, that'll be wicked. Yeah, thanks for that. No worries. But one thing that I do worry about, though, is uh, like this, this trajectory that I opened the conversation up with, which is, it's interesting. The, the the solution that you provide is a digitalization solution to something that is physical. But we've swung so far back in the digitalization and so rapidly that we don't yeah. do face-to-face -face interactions and card swaps anymore and less face-to-face -face events. So yeah. it actually kind of puts your product in this weird situation where if things have progressed in their natural uh, timeline, there would be a good chunk of three or four years for something like Contap uh, yeah. because people would be still doing face to face, but like there would be this problem. But because we've the, the change have been so big, I don't know. Am I totally off the mark in, in thinking in this way? What's your experience within the business? Because you have a, obviously a much yeah. nuanced point of more, more nuanced point of view than me. Yeah, well, at, at the start, obviously, um, no one knew COVID was going to be this massive thing that would basically stop the world. So, obviously, at the start, I was thinking, you know, with, with no face-to-face -face interactions, how are people going to be using the app? And I think since, obviously, COVID and, like you said, the acceleration of digital technologies, we've managed to pivot contact so that it can be used in a face-to-face -face, but also a virtual environment. Mm-hmm. So, um, again, which has led us on to the integrations part, because obviously a lot of people now will be working from home. So if they've got all their business cards in the office, let's say, there's no way of actually going to get those business cards because, you know, you'd have to travel to the office, get them and bring them back. So um, thanks to cloud technology, which we've integrated into the app, 
people can carry on working in hybrid environments or you know work from home work from the office but still have complete access to all of the features and offerings that our platform gives to people that you know, work wherever they want really so mm-hmm. so yeah it, that's that's the beauty of it really it's it's a very flexible platform for people that want to want to continue to use printed business cards would rather go completely digital and use um, contact as their business card but also um, a business card manager at the same time amazing so what do you think is the biggest uh, milestone for you this year i think the biggest milestone for us this year is to to get this integrations section into the app and tested and completely rolled out i think that will completely change the way people use contact and business cards going forward I think there's a lot of potential here. I honestly do. So for for anyone listening in, it's contapp c o n t a p p dot u k. So just uh, go to the website, uh, try. If you go from a mobile device, you, you'll you'll see the link to download there. I think they can also find it in the app stores now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so iOS and Android app stores. Um, it's free to use. There's a free plan as well, and uh, premium plans start from just one pound thirty three per yeah. month. And you have a lot of features like the biometric authentication and the cloud yeah, yeah. backup and and so on. And I, like, am I am I safe in assuming you would appreciate anyone reaching out to you with any feedback for the product? Oh, absolutely, yeah. That's that's what we we look for most, really, from users. Um, anything that you think would improve the app or amendments that you'd like to see in the app, just let me know because it's stuff like that which we can roll out very quickly. And we want to try and bring our users part of, onto this, uh-huh. this journey with us, because yeah, without the users, contact would be just a just a project of mine. Yeah, okay. So that's very yeah. important. I think it's promising, but it's uh, it's it's going to be a challenging ride. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but uh, you you know, it's, it's the founders that stick with it that show the tenacity that usually yeah. make it. And I think I think you got what it takes because our companies share a birthday, so uh, oh. <laughs> that, that makes me optimist, optimistic about this. I have one final question. Like this is rather a very vague, unstructured uh, question that I've been thinking myself, and I just would love to get your perspective on this. Sure. The the startup ecosystems in the U.S. versus in the U.K. How different it is from the perspective of the founder, the experience, and both also also from the perspective of the business, of course, in terms of the acceleration, the available resources. What is your observations or, or your general thoughts ab- about this? Uh, do you think, how, how, in what ways do you think it is different if you think there are differences? In what ways do you think it's similar? Do you think it's easier to build a company in the US versus in the UK? By how far, by how much? Uh, I'm, I'm curious. This is something I've been mulling over for a while now, and I would love to get your thoughts on this. Uh, oh, that's a really good question, actually. Um, I've obviously never experienced uh, entrepreneurship in the US, but I do feel like that entrepreneurship is more accepted and kind of supported in the US um, as opposed to here in the UK. I'm not, not really sure why, but you know, I feel like a lot of people here in the UK kind of want you to go for the funding route straight away whereas i think in in america they're more supportive of bootstrap startups again i don't really have any evidence to back that up that's just from my yeah of um, course experiences really yeah so yeah i think it's more um supported over in the U- in the us the bootstrap journey which obviously we're on whereas in the uk i think it's a lot more money focused which doesn't really help a startup because in terms of starting a startup and going the bootstrap way there's less risks to take Mm. so from my point of view i definitely recommend going the bootstrap path uh, at the start but yeah it would be great to to get the support from people here in the uk for bootstrap startups i think it's a it's a terminology in the making people still have not made their mind about uh, what a an entrepreneur should be uh, and uh, how how they should approach they it's it's just this either uh, overpraised uh, mythical figure who people look at as okay you've already made it and and so on yeah. or it goes uh, to the complete other end of the scale which is you don't even have a job and you're trying to do something that's right yeah yeah there's <laughs> there's no there's no light in between is there yeah that's like the, the, that's my my uh, um, 
I don't know, humble perception on this as just from my single point of view. Like, have you experienced anything similar to, to what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, I, I kind of do, especially in the in the early stages of contact. Um, people are thinking, you know, this is just uh, something that he's doing because he's left his job and, you know, he's just trying something new. When in reality, I, I was working on contact about eight months before it even launched. So, yeah, I think that perception is is true what you've what you've said and i think people have to try and get their head around that you know just because we launched today doesn't mean that i started on the business today a lot of work went into it before it was in the app stores and mm. just an idea so another thing that that is perhaps a part of it is uh, that that i've observed people are kind of skeptical and and i get that skepticism is a part of the culture that we all love uh, and are a part of, but uh, sometimes in the world of startups, uh, the business can be vulnerable. And uh, sometimes you need uh, encouragement and risk taking from your partners, your yeah. B2B partners, your, your your B2C users, or really like take a chance with you. Uh, so sometimes that skepticism can be counterproductive, I would say, in yeah. the world of startups, which is something that, that I have personally experienced. And I know a lot of founders that compared to, let's say, that uh, unbridled, uh, uncontrolled uh, optimism. It seems to be sometimes more about the signaling power, hence what you said yeah. about the investment. Because when you say, oh, we are a startup, we have uh, 3.5 uh, million pounds of investment and so on, then people, you, you gain a certain amount of respect yeah, that, is, that is not yeah. there when you're just hustling as a founder, which I, I, I don't really appreciate, honestly. Uh, I completely agree with that. Um, I've experienced that so much as well people don't really respect you until you've raised millions of pounds which i think is wrong mm. uh, I've, i've spoke to a lot of founders and i'm sure you have as well where you know their product is a lot better than what is you know the million pound businesses that people use on a daily basis so i completely support and respect um, startup founders especially since doing this you know doing the same experiences that of what they've gone through as well Um, so, you know, Facebook was a startup one day, Twitter was a startup one day, Apple was a startup one day. So, um, you know, you have to start somewhere, don't you? Yeah, yeah. And perhaps even this conversation, I think, is a nudge in the positive direction. And f with the audience uh, who has tuned in, thank you for this. And uh, Giuseppe, thank you very much for coming uh, thank, today. No, thank you very much for yeah, giving me the platform to share the story and uh, really appreciate it. And The work you're doing is really good and yeah loving the podcast and the founders that you've had on so far thank you we are we are trying to do the best and we are actually serving the startup ecosystem and i i, I love doing this and our team like doing this and the the core reason is that we care about startups we think i honestly think they're core engines of change that can be positive for the world uh, and i will keep supporting them so uh, thank you very much for being a part of it uh, and then we'll see you in the next episode 100%. Thanks a lot, Ozan.